Um, oh, you did it. Thanks, Phil. Oh. Welcome, everybody. Um, we are actively working on trying to get sound um, on some of our presentations, so hopefully that will come to pass. Um, again, my name is Cecilia Rubino. Uh, I'm a teach at Lang College at the New School, and um, welcome. We weren't quite sure how many people would come for our all physical theater session, um, but I want to welcome my colleagues who are also um, presenting with me today. Um, Leonard Cruz from St. Mary's College, um, Megan Frank um, from Del Arte International, um, Liz Hustler, Liz, um, and uh, Lane Sabado. Am I going to be pronouncing that correct? Uh, um, and Melanie Stewart from Rowan University. Um, so I just wanted to start um, with a little bit of a dialogue and in the hopes that um, my friend Phil can get uh, uh, the sound working. Otherwise, um, so Peter Brook, um, in his lovely text, The Open Door, wrote um, that theater is... Uh, a wide open term. He, he says it, it's almost a word that's meaningless because it creates confusion. Um, one person speaks about one aspect and another speaks about something very different. Um, the word, he says, is like speaking about life. It's too big. Um, but he goes on to say theater has nothing to do with buildings, texts, actors, styles, or forms. The essence, he says, is within a mystery called the present moment. Um, the present moment, he says, is astonishing, like a fragment broken off a hologram. Its transparency is deceptive. Um, and when this atom of time is split open, the whole universe is contained in infinite smallness. So in this session, we're going to talk about um, physical theater. And I want to suggest that those two words together are just as multifaceted and complex. Um, and uh, many of us uh, have all kinds of notions of what physical mean and also what theater means. Um, but I'm going to posit, and the title of our session comes from um, Tang Shuing. Tang is his, uh, his family name, but Shuing um, from Hong Kong, who made the statement that all theater is physical theater. Um, the body is engaged in um, the act of storytelling. But Physical theater practice uh, goes back um, to the ancients, uh, from Greek choral dances um, um, all the way through to, uh, to no theater, who um, no has obviously influenced many current practitioners, um, from Suzuki to Bogart and on from there. Um, but also uh, um, our 20th century practitioners. Um, Stanislavski um, was introduced to yoga by one of his colleagues um, and working on uh, physical practice, particularly at the end of his career in his life. Um, he catapults Meyerhold, Grotowski, um, and on from there. We could go on with these lists of names. Um, but my hope is to, uh, if Phil has got sound going, my hope is to share a little bit of... Uh, uh, Shuing Tang's work with you. Um, I had the privilege of being in Hong Kong and meeting him um, and having a series of long interviews about practice. Um, he actually uh, comes out of a yoga tradition. He went to India and studied um, um, uh, and is, an, is, is a uh, yogi. Um, he also um, uses Tai Chi work um, in, his, in his practice. Um, but interestingly enough, this conference is about this convergence between universities and ensembles. And he said something very interesting. He said he, um, he studied in Paris, but he came back to Hong Kong in 1992 um, and uh, working as a professional director. And then in 1997, um, created a theater company called No Man's Land um, and, and started working um, physically also with video and, and movement practices. But it was when he was hired at Hong Kong, uh, um, uh, uh, the Academy for Arts, um, that he then said he had the time working with his students to develop physical practice. And that really transformed um, the way he worked. Um, in 2012, the Globe Theater um, was, well, actually it was 2011, was hunting the world for um, pieces of Shakespeare to bring to the Globe in 2012. 
and um, uh, Schuwing had done a piece uh, on, called on Titus Andronicus. Um, and uh, he was invited, his company was invited, and at that moment he had actually two versions of the piece. Um, he had a piece called Titus Andronicus, which was text-based, and he had another piece that then he distilled called Titus 2.0, which was really just a physical theater piece. Um, it, it, it stripped the language away. His actors were down to seminal, uh, the, the seminal essence of the, the rage and, um, and uh, um, trauma um, that's embedded in that play. Um, when the producers from the Globe looked at both of the pieces, they opted for the text-based piece um, as, a safe, as a safer bet um, to bring to the Globe in London. Um, they're really interesting pieces of work. His next piece then um, actually stripped language altogether. It's really a dance piece called um, Thunderstorm. Um, um, and um, we're, we just don't have sound, Phil? Uh, no luck, Phil? All right, cool. Um, uh, but like uh, all many of you uh, making your work, um, he's always pushing the envelope. So coming out of a very physically based uh, um, uh, work that he'd been making, his last piece, uh, oddly enough, is all text based. He grabbed an ense his ensemble of actors. Um, uh, he's no longer at Hong Kong uh, Academy, but he runs his ensemble out of the Hong Kong Arts Center. And um, they created a piece um, called um, Why Are You Not Steve Jobs? It's all spoken text. Um, uh, but I'm hoping uh, that I can show you a little bit about the, the, uh, uh, his pieces. Um, and then um, uh, I'm going to uh, allow the next group of presenters to come up. Um, again, uh, interestingly enough, so much um, physical practice, even through the centuries, has been influenced by Eastern practice. And it's really interesting um, to watch uh, this uh, astonishing director in Hong Kong melding um, different traditions. Um, so, uh, you can just watch the images, yeah. Um, no sound. I think Phil is trying to work it out. I'm not sure that the mic, I'm not sure that it's actually coming out of the computer as either. Um, so here we are. Welcome to technology. Um, physicalize it. Yes. Um, yes, so there's a, there's a beautiful traditional flute music that's playing over this. Um, and again, this is the piece, um, Titus 2.0, that you're looking at. Um, And if any of you have been lucky enough to see um, the piece, the Korean piece uh, on Wojciech, um done with 13 chairs, um, there you can see some of that vocabulary in his work here too. This is not No Man's Land. This is a piece called Titus 2.0. No Man's Land was a company that he ran um, back he has evolved um, and has had sev several different ensembles. Um, from what I understand, um, this particular company has a number of his former students um, from Hong Kong uh, Academy of Arts um, and that he's worked with. Uh, he uh, has been working with the, um, a group of um, physical actors and dancers um, over time, but in each new piece he also includes other people. Yes, this one really um, 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 uh, eliminated um, most of the Shakespeare text. There is text in it, um, um, but uh, you can, I, I can show you also the, the one that he took to the Globe, um, which includes in Cantonese um, a lot of, the, of Shakespeare's text. Yes, it is. Correct. And, and Tang Shuing, um, his center, um, also ha has them posted. So he also runs a, an intense training session. In January, he'll be running a session for graduate students, um, um, which is over a six-week intensive period um, um, in his practice. Uh, 
actually, um, his study of yoga happened after he was a professional director. So I think a key, in my dialogues with him, it, I kept prodding him about practice and, and um, just because I'm so, so fascinated by it. Um, and he said he reached a moment um, physically his, uh, that he then needed to go and train and deeply fell into yoga practice and wanted to become um, a master teacher. He uses that um, in, his, in his work with um, his ensemble and with his students, um, but he also says he couples it. So I said, do you use it in every session? Is that how you start? And he says, you know, you can't, it's not codified. So, so one day it's Tai Chi and one day it's yoga, um, um, but using the breath, um, um, so. This is a really, uh, again, he's got some really stunning visual moments. It is kind of cool without sound. Um, I'm going to actually play the, just so that you can see it, the one from the globe. You do? Wow. I think it's. I think it's okay. Um, I think uh, um, for the sake of time, uh, we can uh, we can uh, leave this one out. Let's see. Just so that you can see it visually, this is the piece that he took to the globe. So you can see the same configuration of chairs, um, but again, he's using Cantonese. So you just get a little bit of a taste of this. Um, and again, I, I uh, recommend you perhaps finding his work online as well. Um, so I'm going to turn the microphone over um, to my colleagues here and um, to move on to your uh, discussion of your practice at Rowan, is it university? OK, Liz. Thank you so much. I know that we have. Um a lot to cover today, and uh, I'm really excited that already there's so many intersections. I thought that what Liz Lerman and uh, Mark Valdez was saying is exactly what we had proposed to talk about today, which is in some ways this dichotomy and the way that we tend to think of ourselves as either artists or educators and the way that we think about ourselves as being um, theater practitioners or dance practitioners and how the institution, uh, by its very nature, um, institution versus the profession, which tends to be more fluid, is automatically um, cr creates these sense of boxes and how difficult it is for us to see outside the box. And I think Liz was quite beautiful in her articulation of how easy it is for us as artists to negotiate that territory, but how we often get stuck in that too because we were trained in a certain way and because that training gets codified and solid in us. And back when I was younger, I went to a BFA program, and it was at VCU, and we had the theater program, and we had the dance program, and we took a couple courses with each other, but we never talked. We never really talked. So I was trained as a theater person with text and all this stuff, and I took movement classes, but I didn't know what that was. Now, fortunately, we have Melanie Stewart on our faculty, and she took the time as a dancer to really learn and bridge that gap, and you have to take that initiative yourself. And she came to Rowan University, and Rowan University had a theater and dance department because of financial institutional situations. It was more because theater was a major and dance wasn't a major. But these boundaries were still there even though we were in the same department. But at least that institution necessarily only had one faculty. And this was a place of growth um, for, for Melanie to come into because she understood both languages and she was able to reverse that territory. So what started out as a, just a fluke or a necessity of the institution became ultimately a mission to be able to 
train that. Not just that, but the intersection between her professional practice and the education, which at the time when she came to the Rowan University wasn't supported. The idea that she was doing work in Philadelphia had nothing to do with the fact that she was a professor at the university. So I think she hit her head up against a wall for many years against the old boys network and the way that this was sort of set up as dichotomies. But after they all retired, she had the benefit of being able to forge the vision of really, really um, merging theater and dance and making that a, a central mission and really, really merging professional practice and the academia. And while it's still in its infancy, I think this is something that we all need to be able to do. And so I just wanted to, as the current chair of theater and dance, invite my two colleagues to speak about those two intersections and how we, change, how we look at professional practice and we have this aesthetic of movement theater that we see up here. And even as this gentleman is trying to do, is to look at this practice of the art of the product and then figure out how we at the institution can serve that product by training young people to be able to do this kind of work and get outside of these boxes. It's not easy because the art is always evolving, but the curriculum tends to stay the same. So I think we all sort of face this, and I was just wondering if my two colleagues could speak a little bit about how they've managed to do this and how they've managed to go from here to here. Exactly. Yeah, I think in most programs you will have a, a sense that um, especially if you have a department of theater and dance that you will have theater and dance as the kind of bastard child. And um, dance has always uh, reached out for collaboration, I think, as a way to exist or to justify itself in some way. So the way that um, dance at Rowan really moved from here to here <laughs> was to I, get, I think we began in 1990 to do full-length, extant works of dance theater. So we went away from this idea of doing small little pieces <laughs> by individual choreographers, but gave one person the authority and the autonomy as an artistic director, choreographer, to do a full-length, extant work that was often devised originally with an ensemble. And that ensemble started to include the theater majors. And so really because of um, the faculty interest and the interest in the students, that became one of our main stage offerings, this um, original work of dance theater. And out of that came more and more conversations among the faculty about what we were doing in our curriculum. Um, many of our faculty are professional practitioners, which I'm sure is true everywhere. We were doing work, we were being produced in Edinburgh, we were being produced all over the place, doing original work. And while our program isn't focused on original work, the idea of um, resourceful collaboration came up as something that we wanted to embed in the curriculum of our program. We also uh, began to acknowledge that improvisational skills were at the core of what was needed to inspire our students to honor one another's practice, whether they identified themselves as, hey, I'm musical theater, or I'm a techie, <laughs> or whatever, um, to drive them to work together as a collaborative team and as an ensemble. So we begin, um, so we came together in an intensive retreat and we rewrote all the curriculum. And we begin, um, all students at Rowan begin their practice with dance improvisation. And that's a huge, if any of you know um, or come from these backgrounds, that was huge. You're kind of nodding. It's massive. To kind of think of themselves as dance improvisation. Right. Why am I taking this class? Yeah. So we also, we wanted to create real significant bridges to the professional community. One way is to prepare the students to be ready for the work that ensembles are making in the world. The other is to create internships and real opportunities. I was producing a festival in Philadelphia called New, and I had a foundation funding internship. So students were able to come and work side by side with artists, not as uh, filers or data collectors, but actually working with the artist as assistant directors in the creation of ensemble-based work. Whether you call it dance, which we try not to 
too. We try not to categorize, but to say that this is all theater. And physical theater, uh, a lot of my training comes from Europe, from the school of, of Philippe Gaulier. And so, yes, I understand that physical theater has a certain definition in the world, but we're con continuing to evolve and defy and define and redefine that definition with each work we make. So whether it's an extant work of literature that we're reinventing, reimagining, or something that we're devising from the ground up by bringing an artist from one of the fantastic ensembles that exist in the world or from one of our own faculty members, we're trying to make it new, we're trying to make it fresh, but more than anything relevant so that our students can make meaningful relationships that so when they graduate with $60,000, $100,000 of debt, that they can go into the world, thank you for the thumbs up, they can go into the world with some kind of sense that what they did, they did with a purpose, thank you. Yeah, I'll just try to add some sort of like nitty gritty specifics to what Melanie's saying and how it sort of uh, functions in the in the day to day practice in the university. Um, I want to reiterate that what made what happened at Rowan possible is Melanie over and over again. And we're talking in faculty meetings. We're talking in front of the student body. We're talking in classes. Keep changing the name. Keep removing the word dancer, keep removing the word actor, changing it into performance, and near a week goes by where the students don't hear that and where the faculty doesn't hear it in meetings, and that's absolutely essential. Though I'm the head of acting and directing or head of performance, depending on who we're selling it to, um, and that there's tracks in, in design tech, tracks in musical theater, and a, now a separate major in dance, um, we look to blur those boundaries at every single step of the way. So all tracks have the same freshman year. And as she said, they, they each take a semester of dance improv, one and two, their freshman year. They also take a class with Melanie called Intro to Performance, which is really, I think, the centerpiece for the program in that they're doing only ensemble-based work. You know, the, kinds of things that each and every one of you can teach and would teach with a different flavor, but it's about ensemble building work with the body and the voice. That means freshman year, they're not touching text. There's not a single actor in the program touching text their freshman year, not as far as acting scenes. Acting one is actually a class that begins second semester sophomore year. After they've had dance improv one and two, intro to performance, voice, and movement for the actor with me, all before they take acting one. And it's a real clear, and it's said to them again and again why that's happening, which is that you must develop the tools before you bring on the text, and we will add very rigorous psychological acting after the tool of the body is created. So pedagogically, what's going on there is we're saying that at its very core, performance is about sensing the world with your body and responding physically. And in a great world of viewpoints, those two things should uh, become one and the same. So it's not a, a receiving responding anymore, but the receiving and responding is one uh, uh, unified physical relationship to the world. That that is at its essence what theater or performance or dance is. And then, then you can begin to put strictures on it to control the creative process. One of those strictures can be a pre-existing script. One of those strictures is psychological acting. They all have perfect interplay within it, but the very core, the DNA of performance, must be developed first before you start putting the restrictions on it. So for me, for movement for the actor and viewpoints for everybody in the theater program is a baseline course. So they take a full semester of nothing but viewpoints with me. And it's actually with Cecilia that I began developing, at, at Playwrights Horizons, I began uh, developing viewpoints into a practice for directors. So it also is a source for, for our directors as well. They literally direct with viewpoints as their main tool. Um, and it's not a contradiction. And this is where I think there's certain practitioners trying to move City Company forward, which City Company had at its very core always a very vocal and active rejection of psychological acting. It's, it's not that for us. It's working the DNA of performance and then psychological acting can be added very easily and fluidly over the top of it. If you add what your objective is in a single moment, 
that doesn't inhibit your ability to listen to your partner and respond physically. It's just adding a restriction to that. It's focusing it down, um, the moment down. So it's hugely important that that is understood across the faculty because where a very deep sense of hurt can happen between faculty is a sense of rejection of psychological acting or text work or a sense of rejection of vocal or physical work. If any of those four things are felt, somebody in that faculty is gonna feel very hurt and, told, and, be, and feel like they're being told they're a bad person or unwanted in the department. Yeah. Or it gets cut out of the core of a exactly. BA. And that's really problematic is to develop what courses a student really needs to have and then how to get that practice that we're trying to go into the pedagogy without making it become really rigid. Yeah. Um, and so it means that, you know, the, our new head of musical theater is a long time viewpoints practitioner, so he's excited about it, loves getting up in my classes when I go around teaching high school kids. And, um, and that's important because then I know I feel already appreciated and valued by him, so it's working in that direction. And he knows that I love the idea of vocal uh, work uh, moving forward into song and blurring that boundary. And so we're both, you know, we both are partners in the same in the same journey. That is fought by, by Melanie and Liz in faculty hiring step by step. There's no way that you can just declare this vision and have it happen. It really is fought day to day. Um, in the field, what's going on with the love of the idea of physical theater is we as Americans know nothing better than to go, well, we'll start throwing courses out in various physical practices. Here's a yoga class. Here's a comedia class. Here's a clowning class. Um, and they do not have a dialogue with what the kids are learning in their acting classes. And so it's actually a rejection of physical theater to go down that path. You're saying physical theater is an addendum, an auxiliary that you figure out, it, and we all say, oh, it's tools on your tool belt. And the more tools you have on your tool belt, the better. No, that's not true. I mean, if you give a carpenter a paintbrush and have never really talked about how painting's related to carpentry, that tool's actually really in the way and really confusing. Um, and so the tools have to be integrated. If they don't know how to do psychological and physical acting together, one of them is going to get really severely rejected in, in one way or another. Um, and so I think it's important to figure out how the, the, us as a field need to figure out what Europe has been doing very fluidly for 20 years, uh, which is letting a unified practice be at the base of an ensemble, not these little glimpses at various things that we are, in a sense, being cultural tourists of, as opposed to deeply integrating into our work. Um, so. I, I stress that everybody be careful about cultural tourism when it comes to physical theater. It's actually more negative than not bringing it in, period, in my mind. Um, the final thing I want to do is add something to what Melanie said that's really the linchpin of all of this, which is that if they don't participate and see in performance the result of what you're teaching, forget about it. Because these Here kids can't, the you, you can speak about Pina Bausch all you want and show her on a video, but if they're not making dance theater, they don't have, they'll never conceive of what it is. Um, and so when Melanie says that there's a dance theater piece, that a big one that happens every fall, she means it. And we're talking 25, 30 kids in a dance theater piece, which up till a couple years ago, none of them were dancers. And I'll give an example, like, in the, you know, you, you, can come, you can go to the dance festival, right? But we can't take our work to the Kennedy Center American Dance Festival or whatever it is because our work doesn't fit that definition and hasn't for almost 20 years. So we bring it to the theater. Uh, we bring it to the, you know, the theater. Um, KCT. Yeah, KCT, you know, yeah. <laughs> whatever the acronym is. But just to say that we haven't fit any definition for a very long time. And it's kind of awesome that we're not that we that we're continuing to find that definition, or or just say it's fine that we're not defined, and that we're we keep evolving yeah. to discover who we are. And it's 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 extraordinary what how an actor's life is changed by spending two months inside a dance theater piece. I mean, profoundly changed, and their practice within naturalism as actors will be permanently altered, but it's gotta be part of the production season. 
Thank you, guys. I know that we have um, a participatory um, experience, and I want to make sure we give ample time to our other colleagues on the panel. Thank you so much. I hope that we can have this discussion about how the institution can respond to practice. Um, so we actually have sound now, but I'm not. I'm uh, in, in, which will really help Megan Frank, who's going to have a presentation at the end. Um, if there is time, I'd love to show you the clips that I wanted to share with you. But right now, I'd like to introduce Leonard, um, who uh, will be inviting all of you onto the stage um, for an interactive um, um, session here. So Leonard, please. So that's right. I'd like you all to participate in this. Um, I'm Leonard Cruz. Um, I'm a professor in dance, movement, and theater at St. Mary's College. I just received my PhD last year. It's interesting because um, I danced with Pina Bausch as a guest. She's here at BAM right now. Um, she's having her season. Um, and I will hand out a syllabus that I created with spoken word, music, and dance, and um, intersecting uh, these three art forms. And we're going to just do an exercise with these three art forms. Um, but first, I'd like you all to come out and just um, do a little bit of paper and pens, um, if you have paper and pens. If not, Celia has paper. Do you have paper? Yes. It would be nice. I think it would be nice to have everyone. Um, I was just, um, when Liz Lerman had said to um, speak with someone nearby it, and what uh, resonated with you, um, it was interesting because when she spoke about love, purpose, and risk, I was like, this is why we're here, right? I think it's important that uh, we're passionate about what we do, right? And what we share. And we also have to take risks, right? And the purpose is to share what we love, which is dance um, or movement, theater, right? And so um, um, that resonated with me. So um, let me do an, um, a breathing exercise, and then I'll give you the task.
Yes. Right. Right, you can. Okay. Most definitely. So if you want to improvise the spoken word, you can. So you don't necessarily have to write text if you all have a theme and you want to come up spontaneously with the words, that's fine as well. So there's three for, uh, forms, movement, spoken word, and some sort of rhythm, musicality, sound collage, or song. So try to do this within five minutes, the discussion and writing. And then I would suggest like five minutes rehearsing and trying it out.
So you have like three minutes. Three minutes. If you want to improvise it, you can. You can improvise. Hi, Debbie. Uh, of the spoken word? Yes, you can do that. Right? You can figure out where you want to be in space, how you want to... I think it's important, like, where in space do you want to be? Right? With the ensemble? Yeah, with your group? Okay, so two more minutes, and we'll informally show the work. If you need to, two more minutes. According to authorities, the car was possibly speeding through this residential neighborhood when it slammed into the teens. Neighbors say they know the children who died at the scene, whose names haven't been released. My daughter, she's really sad because one of them was her best friend. It just happened unexpectedly. Like, you never know when. Found, but officers are still looking for two men. We have damage that's consistent with uh, a vehicle collision. We do believe that's the vehicle at this time. Hey, you're Please understand that this is ongoing investigation, so we're still trying to fit all the pieces together and trying to like, notify it next week. According to authorities, the car was possibly speeding through this residential neighborhood when it slammed into the teens. Neighbors say they know the children who died at the scene, whose names... St. Mary's College. It's very south of Maryland. Okay, so one minute, you all are ready? One minute, okay?
Okay, so we have to slowly close it out so we can see the, the informal showings. So we have time for the next speaker. Okay, y'all be first. We'll be first? Yeah, uh, you'll be, since y'all are. Okay, everyone, let's, let's close out because we need a show and then the next speaker. We only have 10 minutes to show. They, I, they, you'll be second. Who wants to be third? Third, fourth, fourth. I'll put them forth and you, oh, fifth. Y'all be last. Okay. Okay, let's, um, let's sit. Yes, yes. If, or, or, or not, I mean, that's up to you or if it's spoken word already. What? Um, okay. Okay, so let's sit, Cecilia, let's sit, we're going to sit and watch. Um, Group two? Uh, no, I think it was them. <laughs> Sorry.
isn't working, brought 60 uh, of the 80 um, first, second, and third graders that they're working with up in Harlem, um, obstacles and circumventing obstacles. Um, we began walking down Lexington Avenue and realized that we couldn't take the students that way because then we would have to cross three blocks of, Wash of um, 125th Street, which has subway gratings with black and brown bodies all over them. So we circumvented and we went down 3rd Avenue and got them to the subway station. As they got onto the subway, many of them were terrified, Ebola, 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 with um, hand sanitizer. So they started rock and roll. We've got soul and we got here. That's our story. Thank you. Group, the last group. So thank you so much for the participation. These are, this is my syllabus, if you want to use it as an example, but really what happened was um, I put like social justice themes and um, the students didn't go that way. It was very much about their identity, it was about what they were going through, um, um, chronic illness, uh, gender. Um, gender inequality. So it was interesting that they really didn't take the social justice themes and put them into heart. The piece became very much about them and their identity. And it was, um, it was interesting. It was not a very easy process. I would try to do it again. Um, yeah, no. 
it wasn't a, a, it, it wasn't what I expected to be. It was a very uh, um, more about the students' experience and their stories instead of um, reaching out globally to what was happening. But just to have a basis if you want to use it um, and then probably start thinking and creating. So no, thank you. Um, so our next presenter is Megan Frank. Uh, so here we go. I'm gonna, would you like me to pull that up first for you? Oh, sure. Hi, guys. My name's Megan. Um, maybe people can get a little bit closer. I've never used this Prezi thing before, so wish me luck. Uh, we're all in this together. Um, oh, and there's dance music, so that's good, too. Uh, the stage must remain a dangerous place. Sure, we can start with, let's start with this, which wasn't the beginning. The actor-poet being a member of an ensemble, a community of theater makers, must be imaginative and skilled in manifesting all aspects of a theatrical world, holding tenaciously to the belief that the world's manifest before the audience need not be representative nor indicative of the incident of our time. The actor-poet must be diviner of the want of our time. Seers, indwellers, capable of manifesting the other, no longer content to reflect reality, but who invent, imagine stories capable of speaking through time with a voice that bears witness to the world that we know. It is the fire of inspiration, the tenacious imaginative reaching, the rigorous invention, the disciplined pursuit of clarity that manifests poetic, prophetic epics capable of igniting a flame, illumination for a path to the future. The question then, who will step into this charged space with the heart to discover, to find in oneself the other, treacherous deceiver, the noble, the valiant? How to strike the bell that is not there, to sound the alarm, to play the pipe, to pluck the unseen strings and cause sound, to be resonant conduit of an impulse, a tone that would remain otherwise inaudible. And when you enter, stop, turn, see the audience. It's for us. Whatever the story, the story must be witness of the basic impulses of our lives, those well, things that, that are necessary. If I don't know him, and we're angry at each other. Not I'm the willing you. suspension of disbelief, please. But a theater like the circus where the actors are doing something, manifesting a world, not just imitating reality. There must be something else. Okay, so welcome to the world of Del Arte International. I'm gonna go back to the beginning of the presentation. This was the end, which is exciting because I think that the voice you heard is of uh, Ronlin Foreman, the director of school at Del Arte International. And I'll tell you a little bit about our school and our company, which exists simultaneously together. As you can tell, he has a very, uh, an idea of provocation which is kind of the basis of our work there. Yeah, let's go back to the actual presentation part of it. Oh, did you, did you go out of it? No, I didn't realize what that was. <laughs> there we go, okay, wait, let's see if we can get here. All right, let's start here. Okay, so Del Arte International is pretty unique. We're the North American Center for the Actor Creator, theater, performance, training, and research. So I can go into a little bit of what our mission is, but we might skip that and go on to our rural location and our international scope. So uh, Del Arte is in a very small town called Blue Lake, California. It's five hours by driving north of San Francisco. It was founded by uh, our founder, Carlo Mazzone Clemente and Jane Hill in 1971, but they moved to Del Arte, or our current building, which is an 
in an odd fellows hall. Um, and the school itself, well, to talk a little bit about Carlo, he was very interested in bringing the European physical training tradition to the United States, and his major uh, influences and mentors were uh, Lecoq, Marceau, and Barot. So here we are. 1975, the school opened in Blue Lake, and in 1976, the Ensemble Theater, the Del Arte Company, also started with this idea of company school, school company, that they exist simultaneously together and feed each other's work. So, uh, based in um, Copo's ideas of the Vieux Colombier, which is basically the idea that the school exists with a company and you want to be in a rural space. So we're in this beautiful place amidst the redwoods. And why rural? Because we are inspired by our natural world and we can go back to that idea that, uh, that the body is a primary conduit as a lot of the language that Ronlin used. And I think it's evident also in your guys' talk about uh, the idea of combining both the mind a sentient mind and a sentient body into one, into one force. So uh, the nice thing that a rural place combines is that it is actually rural, so we have space that's affordable both for the company to exist and also for the school to flourish. Um, and we also have a real local and global scope. So our local scope is that we live in a small town of 1,200 people. Our international scope is that we tour internationally and we bring students from all over the world uh, to our location and that we both have an idea that both of those place both out there and in there directly influence the work that we do. So uh, Joan Shirley, who's also a, a, a co-founder of the school, uh, coined a phrase, theater of place, which I think is quite, uh, quite appropriate here uh, especially as we start to talk about uh, um, how ensemble can be in, in a university setting or even in a setting in general. Um, and also uh, talk specifically about the place of Blue Lake and how it influences us. So, so the model, the company school, school company model. School that up. Okay, so we talked a little bit about theater of place. Uh, the amazing thing about our, our place is that it's artist-run, um, ensemble-based, and as I just talked about, there's a real large idea of the international and the very local happening simultaneously. Again, that paradox, the inner, the outer, uh, all existing in one, in one body. So what does that manifest as? We're uh, an international professional touring ensemble company called the Del Arte Company. This is a recent work called Elizabeth's Book, which is uh, going to tour to Eastern Europe. We have a five-week festival in the summer called the Mad River Festival, as well as many other community engagement models. Um, we got a grant from Art Place America this year to be involved very directly in the idea of creative placemaking, that our school, the arts, drive the economy of, of, of our place, and how do we change the narrative of what we do into that context and how do we understand our, um, our existence in the whole. As well as we collaborated with a lot of really cool partners from in town and around to create some really cool community projects. This was a big community pageant we did to celebrate some uh, micro grants that we gave the community this year. Um, and the third is their Del Arte International School of Physical Theater, which uh, this is our 40th anniversary year which is a pretty exciting thing for us. So, we have 50 students from 12 countries this year, including Iran, Sweden, Ireland, Denmark, South Korea, Greece, Republic of Georgia, India, Zimbabwe, Germany, Canada, Puerto Rico, and the USA. So it's quite a diverse group that we bring. Okay, so our programs. We have the professional training program, which is a one-year certificate program. We have an MFA in ensemble-based physical theater, which is a three-year program. And as far as we know, and please correct me, it might be a really unique one in the world. We haven't found something that's quite 
what we offer in the US for sure. And it's a new thing we're starting is the AEP program, which is basically for people very interested in the master's program, but have not graduated from a university program. So they can take our MFA course and still get a certificate, but they don't get the MFA. We also have a summer workshop intensive and exchange program in Bali, where you get to learn a lot about the mask. Great, so our training mission, to serve, train, and provoke the next generation of theater makers, to assert that profound possibilities come into view only when confronted by the impossible, to confirm that all things change and that movement is the basis for life. So uh, if I were Ron Lynn and he's the director of school and I stepped in for him and his profound way of being articulate about this, but I could break it down. Again, I'm also an MFA graduate of the program. I forgot to mention Megan Frank. I'm the community programs manager as well. Um, that in, in essence, we teach ensemble-based physical theater. And in the essence of that, we like to think that the actor is the creator of the work in all forms and all aspects. Um, this doesn't mean that it's not a collaboration with designers, but it, again, invokes and uh, empowers the actor or the performer to uh, have a voice in their own process. Um, and, and we deal a lot with the essential idea that the body in space and time is the basic genesis for the work. When I say the work, it could be theater work, it could also be life work. So I'm just gonna end with a quote and then that's it. So, uh, I'll just do Carlos, because I think this, this is a really great summation. So characterization must come at home, must begin at home, in the body. Some of us are not at home in our bodies. We must discover what that means. Therefore, the main emphasis of my work is physical, self-discovery. In the walk, we learn to literally understand the character. The nature of any tree begins at the roots. The body must adjust to the foot. There is no choice. So on that, thank you very much. I'm gonna invite my fellow presenters to come up and grab a chair um, and join me. Um, we're gonna have just a brief moment for some discussion. Um, we have about 15 minutes left. Just going to leave this up. Um, thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to pass the mic around. But um, on that note, um, Hey, we got more than chairs than we needed. There you go. Cool, musical chairs. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful that Phil was able to get sound up for Megan. Um, at the very end, as you're leaving, maybe I can pull up some of um, uh, Tang Shuing's work. Um, his interviews are also really, uh, really interesting, um, and they're on YouTube. Um, he has a very cheeky way of talking about um, his uh, codifying some of his practice, physical practice. Um, he calls them the six and a half, um, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna quote him here. Um, he calls them the six and a half uh, methods of discovery um, uh, as opposed to say seven viewpoints. Um, but uh, uh, spatial placement, facial expression, eye contact, voice, breathing, gesture, and the half is percussion. Um, so his statement that we started our discussion with, with, which is all theater is physical theater. Um, um, I want to put it out there and um, say, just have everybody maybe dialogue a little bit about that and then, and then have questions or thoughts that have come up. I, I know that some of you had some thoughts or questions, um, but does anyone want to chime in just in terms of wrapping up uh, um, their thoughts or responding to the work of your colleagues that you saw today? intersections all day. I mean, I think all of us, it's not preaching to the choir to understand that by the very nature of just using the body that, that that's what we do. But I really do like how there's been communication about um, 
the idea that everybody defines it differently still. We all think we're talking about the same thing, but we all have our unique elements of it that we value. And then how do we, how do we find that common vocabulary? It's live. <laughs> so, so let's just open it up. Um, um, does anybody have thoughts or questions um, um, that uh, they wanted to ask any, any of the presenters or um, perhaps have their own um, thoughts and questions? Hi. Uh, so I'm in a position of being a guest artist going into universities. And one in particular has a, it's a department of theater and dance that hasn't undergone the curriculum overhaul that Rowan has but I think they're working toward it. And I'm in a position coming in for a week or two or three weeks and working with both uh, theater and dance students. And I'm just uh, wondering if you can speak to what my role as guest artist can be to help that program in the process of each other, honoring each other's uh, discipline and viewpoints is great and I do a lot of it, but I'm just wondering if you can speak to that. Um, what are you doing? Are you a guest artist teaching or? Teaching, it's a performance lab where, where we're sort of helping other pieces that are in development. We're not directing, no. You just must, absolutely must have them all in the same room for a portion of that time, whatever it takes to get that, uh -huh. and to achieve something with them, it, even if it's just what we did today, so that they begin to be in the room together. That's. They have to be in the room together. Not just them, but their faculty. Oh, okay. maybe that's mm. true, too. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you're helping individual projects that are already in process, you have to respect that, okay, dance has a practice in theater, but could, there, could you carve out a time in which part of what you do is about bringing the two communities together to make something? We do. It, we have those times, but I'm finding there's, there's this... Usually there are more theater than dance students in the room, and the dance students have this inf inferiority thing of, oh, I'm just a dancer, and it, so we're working on... It might be that way initially, but more will come. Mm. I think it takes some years. Yeah, I mean, I would say also just try to be really respectful of the people whose art, entire artistic lives are invested in that place. Exactly. And know that... Um, uh, it's important if you've never been in that situation to know how much emotion is loaded with that. Like literally that's the rest, some of those faculty, that's the rest of their life will be there. And so maybe all that you can do is really excite a group of students and maybe whatever faculty come and then leave it at that and let, let it be, let it take off how it will take off or not. Hi, I was, uh, my name's Stephen Hitt, by the way. Um, I was very interested in what you guys are doing at Rowan because here in the city, I find more and more that our young artists don't want to be actors. They don't want to be singers. They don't want to be dancers. They want to be artists. Or they want to be performers. And I, as a musical theater person myself, going through Broadway and going through concert dance world, am I a dancer? Am I an actor? Am I? So I, I, I try... I can't speak. Um, I try very hard in my work with students to try and train the body to do whatever it is they can do when they're going to make their own work. And so how do we start as, um, as the teachers, as the people who are carrying this out in the world, start making this message um, move out across this country and, and match what we in the universities are saying to what the students are longing to do when they're making new work. Because particularly with me, I have such a diverse student body, I have trouble finding straight white males to play roles. <laughs> because our our population is so, so very different that uh, the work that's written for for people to perform from the 50s, from the 60s, from the 70s, None of these students relate to that, mm -hmm. right. so they're having to make their own work. Yeah, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna be provocative in my answer, and I'm not sure this gets right at it, but maybe it does. I don't know, because I mean, it, I guess the question is, what do you mean by make your own work? Um, do you mean devising new pieces? And that's where I'm gonna be provocative, even to my colleagues sitting next to me, um, purposefully. Okay, <laughs> uh, which is that. 
when we teach devising, it's kind of like it, the danger of it. I think it's great to teach it. I think it's great to set it out as a possibility for students to do. When it becomes, and I'm being purposely provocative, when it becomes a permanent part of the curriculum as if this is a base that you need to learn, the danger is we're rebelling for our students' rebellion instead of letting them choose to make their own pieces away from us because they need or want to make their own pieces. Um, uh, the, by teaching the techniques at which you approach uh, existing work, <laughs> you are giving them, I believe, virtually every tool they need to then go, this work's not good enough for me, I wanna create my own work, and not my colleagues at all, but I have seen other, in other places, and I, I do mean this, that devising is a way of going, you don't need to learn how to confront pre-existing text. And, and potentially as an, ex I know, and this is purposely, see so here's the provocation. And maybe as, you, you, so, I think it's very important to do both. I think it's very important to go, here's the challenges of working within very tight containers, and here's respect for the work of an actor versus respect for the work of a director versus respect for the work of a playwright. And now if you wanna blur those lines, awesome, and let me even help you and encourage you to blur the lines, but let me show you where those lines are. Yeah, or blurring them doesn't mean so I just have to say that in dance, in dance, we've been making our own work since we were born. So we've been making, as I said, at Rowan, full-length extant works that were, if you call it devising, I mean, I've been devising with European artists for a long time, and we brought them to Rowan, who used the term devising since the early 90s. We've been bringing them as guest artists in, like, it, 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 a theater slot, but that took forever for me to convince the theater folks that we should bring someone to actually devise with the students. Whether it's something you can teach, I don't know. But I think this is key, that dance has been making work from, <laughs> from nothing. From and so right now at Rowan University, they are, they've been working since September to create. They slice the air, they're bringing in some fantastic artists, they're making all their own music. This piece is, so it's been going on. Whether you call it devising or choreographing, we get so caught up in these terms. And devising has just become a buzzword for work that's already been happening in and among uh, you know, all of our ensembles for a very, very long time. Yeah, please. Well, I guess I was just gonna add to that that, um, uh, that, that it also could be perspective to really empower a person, an art maker, to understand what their own productivities are or, or what their own perspective as an art maker is. And this, in both ways, uh, language or not, uh, provides this opportunity to really, especially at a, at a developmental stage as a student, to essentially develop that skill, which I think is essential. Right along with that, the two words that I've been using in our practice is definitely, um, as performer, as artist, you can be both. You can be both generative and interpretive. Those two tracks, but just do both. It's fine, right? And, but I think the difference is that at the university level, not as involved as you, um, you know, that the old school, if you will, is still entrenched in just the interpretive, right? And so your new students want to make their own work, but they might not have the tools that they need from the old school. I don't know, those two, those two words specifically have helped a lot. But I, and further than that, I think that in the professional community, right, when we bring in artists from the outside to these universities, they're still tracking the industry, which is not supporting the generative model at all. It's only supporting the interpretive model. And, and I don't think until that changes, for, for the most part, I think that there are a few, right? There are the, the grand few that have made their name now to be able to, to say, I will come see anything by City Company. But there aren't a host of them, like you can name a director or a playwright or a, right? Agreed, and I think this is where, uh, exactly the crux of this argument, and I think we have these discussions as faculty all the time, but, but I think the key is, is when I went to my BFA program as an undergraduate acting student, we were not allowed to take directing, let alone think of ourselves as being independent artists. Like, you were just there to learn how to do it, and then maybe eventually you would be smart enough to put it together yourself. But you were never given empowered with the voice of an artist. You were never, like, smart enough to create your own thing. 
And so we just kind of grew up with that mentality. When you look at dancers that are creating a piece out of nothing but their body, it's a whole different way of working. It's a whole different aesthetic right from the get-go. And I think you're right. And I also think, though, that creating a program like this is also hard because he's head of recruitment and retention. So you label yourself this and you tell your dance students that have been in dance studios for their entire lives, no, you're going to have to take acting classes. Or you tell the, the actors that you have to take. And, you know, so even recruiting this and defining it is really, in terms of the institutional structures, is problematic because, again, the old structure versus new structure and then, you know, the language of dance and how we learn about dance and how we learn about theater is still embedded in us from being small children, right? Yeah, okay. and I, I think the really exciting thing that, uh, and this really connects to what Melanie says, is that in a sense, devising or generative work has existed within each of these disciplines it, it, always. Choreography, directing, playwriting, acting uh, are all generative. Um, and that if we can simply start to, and if we can, and encouraging the students to train in all of them, to cross disciplinary train, is in fact training them to devise. It's training them to be independent theater artists who will carve out exactly the niche that is right for them and their voice. It doesn't mean getting rid of the disciplines, it means cross-training in all of the disciplines. And that's, I think that's a really important distinction. And I think then, ideally, in a utopian world, the, the lines between generative and interpretive actually start to dis dissolve once we respect directors for being generative as well, even if they're taking on Hamlet. Yeah. I wanted to say something about um, the creative process and why we had a problem with this course in particular was that as the director and then taking students' work, I think students, <clears throat> how do I alleviate this competitiveness and what gets in, what's edited and what's out and, and not have this sort of, well, how am I doing? There's a grade here. Why did he cut my... Um, piece of work, and this is something that I'm struggling with, and I don't know if y'all can help me with that in terms of as the loan professor and the director, but it is about the students' works and what gets in and what gets out, and, it, and how do you still, how do you still um, nurture the students' work so that they don't feel like they've been, yeah, cited. Yeah. I think in some ways, you know, you talk about ensemble theater a lot as this as this lateral thing, and that there are real structures to it. And uh, we we don't usually use uh, the term director necessarily. Delarte, we use something called the outside eye, and that it becomes an essential thing uh, for the student to both inside the work be able to develop that outside eye, and outside the work be able to see what it is that best projects what you want to tell. And I think that can also be the, you know, that's what the role of, the, obviously, the, the teacher is too. But that uh, to develop that in the student themselves is not at all a bad thing. I mean, without editing, without the sculpting of things, I mean, that's, that's the world that we live in. And that's the what thing we want to transfer on to the students that make the work. And I think well, that we all know that the platforms for performance and um, the, the structures for performance are evolving and changing and that the work that our students, we're not going to see around that corner to see the work that our students will make. They will change the world. So all we can do is equip them with the best tools possible. And I'm a strong advocate of um, in, instilling this idea for each student um, of a personal practice for them from day one they come in and they begin to define themselves as artists but what kind of artists particularly and what platforms are they interested in because not everybody is going to be on the new <laughs> school stage or you know as as Liz said not everybody's getting to BAM and it is it is not you know, it's not a ladder that goes like this. It is very horizontal. So each student needs to be thinking about how their kind of theater is going to exist in the world and where they fit. And whether it's on the streets up in Harlem or and, and you know, stepping over bodies and make it, changing a student's life or on the stage somewhere in, you know, I don't know, Catawissa, Missouri, it's... It's got to be defined early and called and developed 
out of this practice. So we're going to take one more question here, and then we're going to wrap up. One thing I keep hearing, um, and, I, and it might be a theme that would be worth exploring for the rest of the time, is um, there's this idea of students and then, uh, and then our work. Um, and in this conversation, I've yet to hear um, student as ensemble, as artist. So if, if you all could just insert that ensemble idea into everything, um, that would be Yeah, helpful. I mean, we, I actually run a professional company in Philadelphia, and there's a really fluid relationship between the professional work and, and the students. And it's, it's looking at a real apprentice model that exists in a lot of the world, especially Asia right now, much more than it exists in the U.S., um, and it's a re I think we all know what that is, and I don't need to go into detail about it, but doing the hard work of actually creating that apprentice flow um, from student to professional is really important. Um, and in relationship to that, if you truly respect your student as an artist, the way a yoga teacher respects their student doesn't stop them from minutely changing the foot position in Warrior One. That doesn't mean they don't respect their yoga student. It's actually an act of respect to go, I'm gonna give you the structure and you're gonna live freely inside of it. So to limit, to give your student structure is also to trust when you graduate or in your student-directed work outside of my class, you go right ahead and rebel. You go right ahead and decide, I'm gonna try my foot in a different position. It's a respect for them as an artist to say, here's what I think is a best practice direction and try it with me and then what you do away from me is fine. So this is an ongoing conversation, but again, I think uh, all of us exist in a world where there is no teaching without learning, um, and reciprocity and, um, um, is the essence of ensemble, but it's also the essence of theater, and it's the essence of, of, of um, uh, teaching practice. Um, so lots of questions um, and, and still um, dialogue. I'm hoping that we can continue to talk to each other um, in further sessions. Um, and I wanna thank you so much for joining me um, in a very uh, um, uh, eclectic um, look at uh, this practice of, of physical theater. But thanks a lot, you guys, appreciate it. Thanks.